Edmund Nielsen Woodwinds has been serving the Double Reed community for 70 years. Nielsen sells a wide variety of oboe, oboe de mort, English horn, bassoon, and contrabassoon reeds and cane, as well as reed-making accessories, reed cases, and lafrex. And of course, they have the classic Nielsen wedge knife, which features a double hollow ground with a choice of handle size. In addition, they have many other knives available. Nielsen has long been known for their large heckle bassoon vocal inventory. Fill out their online trial form to start a trial and find the perfect heckle vocal for you. For all your double reed accessories, Nielsen is ready to help you. Hey bassoonists, are you looking to ramp up your reed making? Well, Barton Kane has the solution for you. They offer over 60 variations of precision gouged shaped and profiled bassoon cane. Use coupon code free shipping for orders over $150. This includes international orders. Go shop now at www.bartoncane.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. How are you? What, where has this Thanksgiving break taken you? I'm fantastic. I am visiting my parents in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the plan today is to go thrift shopping with my mom, which is our twice yearly ritual whenever I come up here. And um, yesterday I took a three hour nap and then went to bed at 930. So it's been fantastic. <laughs> about you? Yeah, same. Yesterday, I took a three-hour nap, and then my husband woke me up to tell me it was time for bed and that I should move from the couch (laughs) to bed. So I think I needed to catch up on some sleep is probably what that means. And uh, yeah, that's what break is for. So very happy to Mm -hmm. do it. Well, we just got back from an amazing weekend in Flint, Michigan with our dear friend and podcast listener, Carl Angelo, we went out and played on his concert series at the First Presbyterian Church of Flint. And it was an incredibly beautiful church. And we got to play just a really fun program of oboe bassoon piano music. And Carl was fantastic. And so, hi, Carl. We're, we know you're listening. And we had a wonderful time. Thank you so much for, you know, inviting us up and and spending some time. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, I got a little sick over that trip and I'll spare everyone the details, Mm. but you both were so gracious in helping me (laughs) power through and, uh, and power through you did. I was really impressed. I had a little bit of a like warrior moment where I was like, okay, I'll be able to look back on this and be like, if you could get through your a Flint, Michigan illness extravaganza. <laughs> you can do this. So, yes, I'll let people imagine what that means. I'll... <laughs> I was very concerned for you, but it was. It ended up being great. You sounded beautiful. We powered through, and this episode, believe it or not, is our three-year double read dish anniversary. Oh my God, I'm going to cry. I cannot. It doesn't, in some ways, I guess it feels like we've been doing this forever, but three years has just come up so quickly. Who would have thought? I know. I'm so proud of us. You know, it's been, it's been really, you know, filling my well, so to speak. Well, I'm glad you said that because for the dish today, I had the idea, um, like, you know, when Oprah did her 25 year anniversary and she had all those like special reflections and everything. No, I missed that. Oh yeah. They're like all over. She'd like catch up with past guests and all this type of stuff. And I co-opted and kind of adapted where necessary some of her reflection questions of doing 25 years of her show and thought we could answer a couple of reflective questions and just kind of reminisce on three years of the podcast. Of course, three years of double read dish equals 25 years of Oprah's talk show. Obviously. (laughs) 
so the first question we need to answer is what is the best part of doing the podcast? Ooh, I'm going to say that the best part is that we are doing what we set out to do. Remember when we were talking about it before we started the podcast and we were like, you know, we need to create a resource for people who may not have access to private teachers, you know, I guess just with fewer resources, if there are anyone really out there who's interested in what it would take to, to be a oboist or a bassoonist to just have the knowledge just through access to the internet. I think that's really special. And I'm so incredibly proud that we are able to actually do that. Well, my answer sounds selfish in comparison to yours, but (laughs) (laughs) my probably best part of the podcast is that it has been, not that we wouldn't have maintained our friendship, but I feel like it's brought us closer having this kind of like collective project and now giant pile of work and contribution that we haven't done it individually. We've done it together and it's afforded us the opportunity to travel together and dream together and brainstorm and execute. And I feel like it's just uh, been a really cool uh, product of our friendship. I a thousand percent agree. And when we first, you know, before the podcast, we were very close friends, but now we're family. And I think that's because of the podcast. And I love you so much. Oh, I can't. <laughs> All right. Enough mushy stuff. <laughs> What's the worst part of doing the podcast? Ooh. The worst part of doing the podcast is me feeling like the biggest dum dum in the world when I mess up our time conversions. <laughs> <laughs> Because for some reason, I cannot get my mind around time zones. I just, it's gotten to the point where you will text me, be like, be very careful about this time conversion. (laughs) (laughs) This is a big one. Make sure you're on at the right time. (laughs) What about you? My worst, I certainly don't mind, but just maybe all the logistics of, you know, we try to stay ahead of recording interviews, Mm. getting it all assembled. And so kind of being on top of all the editing and just making sure I'm getting it all done in a timely manner and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay. The biggest scare that the podcast has given you. Oh my God. It was (laughs) definitely, you know what I'm going to say, right? Yes. I know what you're going to say. (laughs) In fact, I so knew what you were going to say that I was like, okay, I have to come up with something that's not that because she will definitely say what I know she's going to say. So speaking of time conversions, when we <laughs> when we scheduled an interview with Diana Doherty, who is my oboe shiro, you know, it's, it's, she's just amazing. And so we scheduled the interview and I was like, okay, it's going to happen on this time and this day. And of course, she lives in Australia. So there was a very big time conversion. And then about 20 minutes before the interview was supposed to start, I thought it was starting the next morning. I had gotten it completely like 12 hours wrong. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll just double check that time conversion. Thank God. Like I had an angel looking out for me because then I realized that the interview actually started in 20 minutes. <laughs> and so I called you and I was like, um, the interview starts in 20 minutes. I did it wrong. We need to do it right now. <laughs> and at that time, I live kind of in a more rural area. And at that now it does. But at that time, I did not have high speed internet at my residence, it wasn't available where I lived. And so I had to always drive into work, which is 15 minutes away. (laughs) (laughs) So Jackie, you were like, you were so nice about it. You're like, okay, I'm going there right now. I'm going to start my computer in the car. I'm going to run in. I'm going to be, I will be on time, but I will be right on time. And I was like, oh my God. And then... (laughs) We got online and then <laughs> immediately called Diana and we're like, hi, Diana, how are you? It's so Hello. nice to talk to you. 
We're on top of everything. <laughs> kind of similarly, I think technology issues will always be our biggest scare. And I remember we were interviewing Alex Klein and this was only episode 10. So we were still very new at this and we were recording and a huge thunderstorm came through yeah. Cape Girardeau and it actually interrupted about this. the connection um, electronically. And so all of my stuff turned off and then immediately restarted. And it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, no, 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 no. And <laughs> just obviously we're so grateful when people are generous enough to give us their time yeah. that having some huge technology error just makes us feel so you know, like big clods and like we're wasting their time <laughs> and not being respectful. And I remember just trying to like turn it on as fast as I can and then trying to remember the last thing I heard and make him restart his story. And oh, that was my biggest scare. But he was, of course, very gracious about it. Very kind. Of course. Yeah. Very. Yeah. We've had some heart in the throat moment. Yes. <laughs> Whoopsie doopsie. <laughs> uh, biggest glory moment for the podcast. I think probably when we did our first live show mm -hmm. uh, at Miami, Ohio, when we were standing backstage and we were looking at, e looking at each other, we we're like, oh my God, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of us. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm going to start crying. And then I went on stage and like walked into a chair. <laughs> <laughs> How about yours? I think mine would be our live show at IDRS this last summer. Oh, like, yeah. Totally not knowing how it was going to go over. And then someone came in and said, uh, because we were checking the tech about a half hour beforehand. And someone came in and said, people are already lining up and looking. Oh. And sure enough, there are about two dozen people lined up outside the door. And it ended up being, you know, standing room only. It was an insanely hot room because there were so many people squished in there. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh my gosh. And it, we had so much fun. It was so much fun. Something a guest has said that has stuck with you. Okay. So I talk about this one all the time. Um, when Eugene Isatov was talking about winning auditions and he compared the four objective elements of music to the four wheels of a car, I use this all the time, rhythm, accuracy, intonation, and dynamics. And he said that if you have three of the four wheels, but you don't have the fourth, the car is not going to go. So you have to take care of the objective elements that can be concretely measured and make sure that those are in place when you're auditioning. And the rest of it is important too, but it's subjective, like tone and articulation and interpretation. There's a, there's a wider range of acceptability, but you have to take care of rhythm, accuracy, intonation, and dynamics. That I use constantly because it's genius. For me, um, it was very serendipitous that the two bassoon episodes of Benjamin Kamen's and Kim Laskowski were back to back because uh, mm -hmm. I felt like they mm -hmm. acted in tandem really beautifully in terms of one's path. So I actually tend to think of them as a pair which is interesting because mm -hmm. I don't know if they even know each other, but in my mind, they're very <laughs> united. Um, and especially Kim, who had a very unique path, if everyone remembers, mm -hmm. spoke very honestly about prioritizing happiness mm -hmm. and about prioritizing um, pursuing goals in a way that's not related to expectations and especially expectations of time. And uh, that really stuck with me, especially what I was going through personally, just kind of needing that perspective. And so her thoughts on uh, music as a lifelong pursuit for personal fulfillment and not mm -hmm. things you know, are you doing this for your art or are you doing this for things, for titles, for money? And uh, mm. I go back to that interview. I don't really love to listen to our past episodes. It's a little too like meta for me, but I do go back <laughs> to uh, her words and her thoughts on that when I feel like I need just some perspective knocked into my head. I love that. All right. Last, what are some of our goals or something that you look forward to in Double Dish future? I always look forward to 
the interviews because it gives me so much, you know, just the process of talking to all of these people just purely selfishly gives me so much perspective and um, fodder in my own teaching. But I would love to do more live shows with you, do more performances. I really, really love meeting people who like the podcast, listen to the podcast, like our friend Carl, and pursuing these unexpected opportunities that are afforded through the podcast. So I just really, you know, I'm the... I'm the extrovert of our duo. So I, I really look forward to the times when we're able to interact with the actual people who listen, just because, you know, we put out this digital file that is listened to over the internet. So we, you you know, we don't actually get to know the people who are listening as much as I would like. So yeah, I love the, the live component that we've started doing. How about you? Well, we have some big projects that it's maybe not time to talk about because it might be several years before they come to fruition, but I always look forward Mm -hmm. to those and how they'll manifest. Um, But tangibly, and maybe very specifically, I think we can talk about it now because we did a call for questions and it's been recorded, but releasing our interview with Sophie Derveau was kind of this like, how did we get here? moment like mm-hmm. we are talking to a member of the Vienna Philharmonic okay uh, <laughs> and I admire her so much and I, I actually study her a lot I go to her recordings to continue to learn so personally that was so cool and I know that a lot of people feel the same way about her um, not just bassoonists she she transcends instrument specificity so I'm looking forward to releasing that because I think people are going to be really excited about it and uh, yeah just continuing to keep on and see what else there is to come. So yeah. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. So I want to talk to you guys about Sing and Dog Double Reads. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Visit them at www.singindog.com to see all of their products and you'll be glad you did. That's Sing and Dog Double Reads. Everyone knows that Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality and service in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on at Genda Industries. Did you know you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall is like a farmer's market filled with talented local and regional reed makers selling their reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. Who knows? One day they may be your reeds for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, all caps, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and read tool roll. Visit them at www.gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're more than just read knives. We are thrilled to welcome to Double Read Dish, Michael Burns, professor of bassoon at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Would you start by telling us how you began playing the bassoon? Absolutely. It's actually a question I always ask whenever I do like a high school clinic or something, because why on earth would somebody choose instruments as bizarre as ours in the double reed world? I don't know. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot of, of, of uh, interesting sort of um, stories. I don't think mine is as interesting as some of the other ones I've heard. I'm, As you maybe can tell from my accent, not originally from North Carolina. I'm from New Zealand and, (laughs) and I had started out, I came, um, I'm the youngest child from a fairly musical family. So I was surrounded by music a lot growing up and had played piano when I was quite young. And I decided that I wanted to play an orchestral instrument and did the thing where I, listened to Peter and the Wolf and 
the young person's guide to the orchestra and things of that sort, as well as just listening to some other repertoire and pretty much decided that the sounds that I liked the most that interested me the most were those of the horn or French horn and the bassoon. And at that time, uh, one of my best friends started taking horn lessons and I didn't want to be a copycat. So the bassoon <laughs> was the, the, uh, the logical choice from there. Um, and I think I'm, I'm now watching my, my friends and colleagues on the horn. I think I, I am really glad because while we have to put up with reed making and, and other eccentricities, um, there are some things about the horn playing, all of those nasty partials too close to each other that mm-hmm. are a lot to deal with in the horn world, I think. Count your blessings. Yeah, yes, exactly. I agree. <laughs> but it's been actually really interesting hearing some of the other origin stories from, from kids. That seem, I, I, I've kind of um, ended up categorizing them in some groups. There's, there's the, the, the conscripts where, you know, oh, we're going to be going to, the band is going to be going to competition and we need somebody to play bassoon. Hey, you, you've got big hands or, or um, you're not very good on the third clarinet part or, you know, whatever. How about you? And then there are the people that are the ones that are sort of, they see this weird instrument from across the room or they hear the sound or combinations of the above and they go, I want to play that thing. <laughs> but one of my favorite is the number of people that have done something like gone to their band director and said, what's the hardest instrument that I can play? <laughs> and the chances of them coming up with one of the double reads as the answer is pretty high, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how we get some of our, you know, great double read uh, students in the future. Oh, it makes you question everything, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So after you selected the bassoon, can you walk us through your educational path to becoming a professional bassoonist? I was actually just talking about this with one of my students today that, that um, there's a, a, there is a difference in the sort of the, the way that somebody comes through the system in New Zealand, which is different than the system in the U.S., so the typical students that I get here, um, you know, have been playing and, and most likely started in their high school band, which is a, you know, symphonic wind and brass and percussion band. Mm-hmm. Um, in New Zealand at the time that I went through, they didn't really have this sort of band really existing. It started, it's, it's been established now, but at the time I went through, and, and still today, to some extent, they have the tradition of the, the British brass band. So the brass players and the percussionists would play in a brass band. And if you played a woodwind instrument, then from a very early age, you actually started playing in orchestras. So oh, I basically grew up playing in youth orchestras from a very young age, probably starting about age... 12 or 13, um, which was when I also started playing on the bassoon. So soon thereafter, I started playing in a, in a youth orchestra. And just the aesthetic of, um, you know, learning to blend with the cellos and basses and violas versus what I see a lot of the high school kids here deal with of every note that they play in band is most likely doubled by the tubas and the euphoniums and the saxophones and the trombones and the everybody else's, Mm -hmm. I think leads to a a kind of a different approach to learning the instrument. Anyway, the the aesthetic of, of, of playing in the orchestra and from the very young age, I mean, that, that was really appealing to me um, all along. And I actually, I'm the youngest of five kids and uh, like I said, I was from a musical family and some of my my older siblings had gone into music. So one of the things my parents had said as I was graduating from high school, where I'd done music a lot um, throughout, was, oh, well, you know, you you should do something else other than music. You know, don't don't do that that career that's so um, nebulous and so so difficult to make a living and everything in. And being 
mostly somewhat dutiful. I actually started my undergraduate degree in social sciences, of all things, which, of course, looking back on it now, being in academia, is not exactly a major career path in and of itself, especially <laughs> at the, the undergraduate level. But I did okay in that first year, but I didn't do as well as I might have academically because I kept on going off and playing gigs all the time. And not only was I a bassoonist, I was actually also a rock and jazz drummer of all things. Wow. And so I was, I was off playing classical concerts and jazz and rock concerts and gigs um, and not doing as much of the study I could. And so I, about mid year said to my parents, you know, I really think I need to just go ahead and do this music thing. So I essentially started over um, the, the um, undergraduate degree and went to Wellington, which is the capital city in New Zealand and did um, a bachelor's degree there. And then there's an additional year. You can do that. The, the bachelor's degree in New Zealand is a three year degree. And then I did a fourth year, which is the honors degree. And then my teacher was the principal bassoon of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra at that time, Colin Hemmingson. And he had studied uh, in Boston at NEC with Sherman Walt. And so I sent Mr. Walt um, a recording of my recitals from uh, my undergraduate degree and asked if I could come study with him. And he wrote back a very nice letter and I was accepted into NEC to do a master's degree. Um, and I had thought at the time that I was going to be coming over to the U S for like the two years of the, of the degree and then going back to New Zealand and, you know, playing and things. And, um, there were a few things that changed along the way. One of which was that, um, Mr. Walt was convinced by the Boston symphony not to retire yet. And then he was too busy to be able to teach. So I got over there thinking I was going to be able to study with him. And in the first year I was not able to, but instead actually got to study with uh, Leonard Chero, um, which was very nice. And then Mr. Walt sort of took pity on me and took me in as basically his only student the, for my second year of the master's. But the other thing that happened is I met a young lady who I ended up uh, marrying and my two years of being away from New Zealand has extended <laughs> by um, several decades now. So I'm still here. I uh, went on and did a doctorate. Um, we had um, my wife and I got married after we finished the master's degree and actually had job offers to play in the Mexico City Philharmonic, but there was a number of events that, that came together that basically led to us not ending up going and doing that. Um, amongst them, they kept changing the date and the time that we were supposed to start. And at one point they put it like two days before our wedding um, mm-hmm. that we'd had it planned for a long time. And then the exchange rate was fluctuating greatly, mostly not in our favor when we had student loans in America that we'd have to pay back. And anyway, we didn't end up going to Mexico city. So we went um, for a year to Indiana university and then um, went to Cincinnati for a doctorate. And it's, it's kind of ironic to me now that my college teaching position, as you guys know, essentially the minimum requirement now most often for a, a college teaching position is the, you know, a doctoral degree. Mm-hmm. When I came over to do my master's, um, I don't think I'd even, well, I, I knew what a PhD was, but I didn't know there was anything, you know, the equivalent of a DMA. And it was not on my radar at all. And I'll have high school kids now that are talking about that that's what their career path is. Mm. Oh, I'm going to do my undergrad and then I'm going to do a master's and then I'm going to do a doctorate and then I'm going to get a job just like yours. And it's, it's interesting to me because that was not something I even knew about. There, there is no equivalent of the job that I currently have in New Zealand and, and pretty much can't be. The population isn't of a size to sustain that and like I said the model is a little bit different there so because they don't have the symphonic bands well actually when I went through um, no band or orchestra or chorus or anything in high school was actually curricular when I went through high school 
So everything that we did, all of our rehearsals were extracurricular. Um, so there is not the position of a college band director, which is what many of my undergraduate students are here doing the music education degree. So th there's just not the population to support somebody being a professor of bassoon. I always have to explain to people in New Zealand what it is that I do, and they, they really don't understand it because there is nothing like that over there. Well, I'd love to talk about your um, transition from New Zealand to the United States. But first, before we get into that, whenever we have people who studied with these legendary figures, we love to ask them about them. And we actually haven't had someone who studied with Sherman Walt. So uh, would you mind talking to us about Mr. Walt and maybe a bit what lessons with him were like and what your experience with him was like? Sherman Walt was was phenomenal. I mean, I, I had grown up partially because of the influence of uh, my teacher in New Zealand, having studied with him. And actually, there was sort of a, uh, a New Zealand pipeline. There was another bassoonist that had gone over in between um, who had studied with my teacher in New Zealand and, th and then went to Boston and studied with Walt as well. But, I, you know, I'd grown up listening to those iconic recordings of the Boston Symphony from the 1970s through, you know, the um, late 80s mm -hmm. um, when he retired. And, and uh, he was a, a phenomenal player and an uh, excellent teacher. He basically, I ended up being his only student for what was his final year in the orchestra. He sort of took pity on me because I'd come over specifically to study with him. And he would have me come and take lessons at his house and they would often end up being two or three hours long. And he would insist on paying my subway fare um, because, you know, I was being inconvenienced by coming out to his house, which I didn't mind at all. The lessons were, were fabulous and, and um, covered a, a, a broad spectrum. He, was a um, very generous person. He could be a little bit, actually there was a newspaper article about him, I think in the final year that he was with the, the BSO, where they described him, or maybe he even described himself as being a little bit salty. And he could, he could be that. He, he wouldn't take, uh, he wouldn't suffer fools well. And there were some things that he would speak up about if he, if he felt that they were not right. And he would sometimes talk about things that were happening with the symphony in the lessons. And I remember very distinctly in one lesson, um, they had just announced the auditions for, for, you know, the position to replace him. And so I come walking into my lesson with the audition notice and maybe even the exit list, I think, and talking with him and a, a very, um, probably he, he wouldn't have had any, any idea how, what an influential uh, conversation we had, but it was extremely important to me where he said, well, you know, uh, I, I was asking, you know, should I, should I take the audition? Should I do this? And his response was, well, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a good player. You, you, you could do well with this, but what if you won? And I'd never thought about from that perspective, it, it had always seemed to me like the goal was always to get to the point of getting to the audition and then you win and then, you know, the world is your oyster and everything is fine. But what he was pointing out is you know, this is a job that you can't learn while you're on the job. You have to already know what you're doing when you walk in the door here because the schedule is such that you you have all of this repertoire that you're in, in um, responsible for and that you have to be at your top performance the entire time. Uh, I, nobody had ever talked about that with me, and, and perhaps it was just my own naivety, but I, I actually see that from some other students now that I'll teach that will have the stars in the eyes about, oh, wouldn't it be great if I get this job? And we're thinking about the possibility of, oh, we just you know, play bassoon all day and we've got these great people around us and we play this great repertoire and this great hall. But we don't think about what we would have needed to be ready to do such a job. And it really, I didn't end up taking the audition uh, because I really wasn't 
ready by any stretch of the imagination. And it's actually had, a, a, as I said, a really pretty profound uh, impact on me to think about, well, what does it take to be ready? So that if I'm, I'm working with a student that is wanting to be in the performance realm, I bring up elements of that conversation with them to think, to make them think it's not just learning even the most, you know, top 20 excerpts. It's not just being good at playing the instrument. There's a, there are many, many subtleties and, and um, norms that need to be learned that you really can only learn by sitting in the seat and playing, I think to an extent. And so um, while there are occasionally people that will win an audition as, you know, in a, top major orchestra as the first one they've ever taken. That's really the exception rather than the rule, I think. So we, we covered um, orchestral excerpts together. He spent a lot of time working from multiple etude books. Um, we certainly did some solo repertoire together. Um, he very much was happy for me to choose the repertoire overall, and he would give some suggestions from time to time of, you know, maybe not that one, maybe this, or, you know, whether something was, if it was the right time to be looking at a piece of repertoire. But really it was honing the skills of being a bassoon player. He, he never, he didn't like to, to teach read making. He had a very good relationship and had tended to send his students to, uh, Lou Skinner for read making. So we didn't really work on read making in the lessons. Although another influential thing that I had from him, and then later actually a very similar one from uh, Winstead, who I worked with for my doctorate, was when I had a um, a lesson that I was doing that thing that I also observe my students doing now from time to time, where. Um, oh, I can't play this. The reed felt fine yesterday, but then the weather changed and, you know, everything's terrible and my reeds don't work. And Mr. Walt saying, well, if your reed's properly balanced, then it's not really impacted by the weather changes. And I thought that that was sort of like a unicorn thing, you know, some mythical statement. And then a few years later, basically very similar statement from Winstead in a lesson. And it wasn't until probably several years later on past that, that I actually started to experience that occasionally where I'll, I'll have reads that just don't seem to worry about weather changes and climate changes and, and temperature and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've had literally the same read that is played um, up in the top of the Canadian Rockies and down on the coast and in different countries and multiple different things. And the reed basically feels the same no matter what. And then I go, oh, that's what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, they're a rare, rare beast. So, I think that's somewhat true for oboe reeds to a certain extent also. It's not necessarily over altitude changes, but I've had reads that I can kind of play anywhere. Right. I think the altitude thing is actually a physical property because the air is literally thinner mm -hmm. as you go higher up. So I mm -hmm. think there it's a matter of the, that the air column is actually a different size. Oh, so I, I think I never that, of that that's actually a physical property that you can't really change, but dealing with humidity and temperature I think it can be to do with, with, you know, the balance of the read. Mm. So you talked to us a little bit about the difference in curriculum in terms of music education between New Zealand and the United States, but I'm curious what that experience was like for you as a person, as a young adult to come over across the world and um, study in this completely new place. Was that, um, culture shock or, or very easy. We have a lot of um, international students who listen and people who are considering studying abroad. And so I'd love to hear what that experience was like as a whole for you. It, it's interesting because there were definitely some, some elements of it that were very much culture shock, but of course the, the American culture in some way, shape or form 
is often very well known in many of the other countries, hmm. even if it's just from goofy television shows and stuff, but there's, there's, there's so much American material that, it, that was out there. I mean, in New Zealand growing up, we had at the time I was there only like three television stations and they would split the programming content between shows that came from the U S shows that came from Britain and then some domestically made ones. So it was interesting because we'd go from um, uh, mash to um, <laughs> some British uh, cerebral show or comedy or something like that. And then would have a New Zealand show. So there was a lot of elements of at least a, preconceived notion of what American culture was. Mm -hmm. So in some regards, some of it was like, Oh yeah, I've seen this on TV. I know what this is. And of course the music world, um, while there are definite different schools of thought and playing, there's a lot that is in common. I think my experience has been, you know, internationally that a lot of things about playing, you know, a great piece of music, it almost doesn't matter where you are playing it because you, some of some elements of the experience are going to be the same. So in that regard, I, I didn't find that much adjustment. So just silly things that, that did require adjusting. I, I, I knew that coming from New Zealand and going to Boston, which greater Boston's population, I think was larger at that point than the entire country of New Zealand was. Mm. Um, I knew that I was going to, you know, a big city, and that it would, would feel very different. And it did. And I knew things like that, you know, people drive cars on the other side of the road from what I'd grown up being <laughs> used to and things of that sort. But, but something that I, I didn't consider, um, my first night in Boston, I had, I had a few misadventures because I didn't think of, of like I was going to stay and try and get a room in, um, a, youth hostel or like a, a YMCA or something. And I knew that there was one immediately adjacent to New England Conservatory. What I didn't think about, because this was not my experience, especially from my hometown in New Zealand or even in the capital city, was that they're asking a, a cab driver at Logan Airport to take me to, quote unquote, the YMCA. And then they say, which one? <laughs> like I have no idea. And anyway, <laughs> we eventually found the correct one, and I'm pretty sure that the cab driver took me on a somewhat roundabout route once they realized oh, that I had no clue mm -hmm. what was what. Um, and they dropped me off at I, I, I'd flown in reasonably late, and I think it was like 11:30 at night or something. And they they drive away, and I go in there, and it, the, it we eventually found the one in Back Bay, which is close to New England Conservatory. And uh, they had no rooms available. So then I had to call another cab and I basically got in and said, can you find a <laughs> hotel somewhere close? Um, all pathetic. And they did, which was very nice. Um, but I get in, finally get into the hotel room and it's, I don't know, after midnight. And I walk in and the light switch is in what in New Zealand is in the on position and the lights are on. I'm like, Oh great. On top of everything. Now my lights don't work. Oh, oh well, I'll save them. The electricity. I flip it the other way and the lights come on. I'm like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just, I mean, it's the silliest little thing, but that's what made me suddenly feel homesick. Oh yeah. Literally everything is upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> Although what's funny is the accents, like the Boston accent is not worlds apart from a New Zealand accent. So I bet you could have like fooled some people if, you know, you needed to <laughs> well, from time to time. <laughs> you, think so, right? that, you know, you could park the car in Harvard Yard and stuff, but, but actually they, they found it harder to, to understand me. <gasps> and I, I, and whether this was just plain stubbornness on their part, but Again, sort of showing my age and generation, I had run around with one of those old fashioned cameras that took film, mm. taking, taking shots of, of my surroundings in Boston to, um, 
eventually then get developed and send back to my family in New Zealand who wanted to see, you know, where was I staying and studying and living and stuff. So I, I took it into a neighborhood, you know, drugstore or whatever. And you do the thing where you drop off the, the film and you get like a little tear off part of the envelope with your name on it mm-hmm. and a number as well. I don't know why they couldn't have looked at the number, but so I go in whatever week or whatever it is later after it was supposed to be developed and I'm going to pick it up. And it's like, you know, what's your name? I like Burns. Um, and he's like, huh? I said, Burns. And he said, how do you spell that? <laughs> B-U-R-N-S. B-U what? <laughs> and I learned, I learned right then. I said, Burns. B-U-R-N-S. <laughs> And he's like, well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> uh, I've, I've learned that, that even in Boston, that uh, my New Zealand R's um, uh, uh, were not sufficient. <laughs> oh, we're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> So you had mentioned that a DMA hadn't even been an option in your mind. What le- what led you to pursue the DMA and then a career in in higher education? That that's a very good question. I, I even though I didn't really know about that degree, especially when, when I was beginning my masters, um, what I did know is that my perceived ideal career combined the opportunities of some performing and some teaching. I I knew that I loved both of those things and um, what I determined, and I think it's more or less still true today is that there were sort of two primary pathways that I could take to achieve that goal. Um, One would be to win an orchestral job in a large urban symphony and then have opportunities to maybe teach as an adjunct at a conservatory or music school in the area. Uh, And the other I determined, um, you know, while in the States was the, the path that I ended up taking, which is to go on and do the doctorate and then um, get a college teaching position where there is an expectation that as part of your uh, job description, you will uh, pursue creative outlets. Like we have um, an equivalency in academia for people that are in music performance. Uh, And it's similar where if you're in theater and dance and many of the other performing arts that the equivalent of writing a research paper like like a uh, mathematician or a scientist or somebody in in some of the the other disciplines in the university would do that what we do instead oftentimes are um, creative and performing opportunities so there's an encouragement for people in a um, collegiate position to be performers. And I was aware of that. And one of the things also that was particularly attractive about that is the diversity of the types of performing that uh, opportunities that come up and also the freedom of what we can choose to pursue or not. So, I mean, consequently, I am able to play chamber music. I am able to play solo recitals. Um, I, I play with orchestras and opera orchestras and um, quite a, a variety of, of um, different performing outlets. And some of my friends and colleagues who took the orchestral route, um, certainly some of them do also have a variety of options and get to play chamber music and solo things. But many of them, really they only get to do the orchestral side of things. And of course they, the repertoire is chosen by somebody else and a conductor is going to determine the speed that they play things and maybe 
control things about the dynamics and even about their musical interpretations. Um, I still have some of that, but because I'm working with such a diversity of different groups, I, I often get more elements of control. Um, some of which one, you know, if one's a freelancer, you can't say no too much, but I'm somewhat in a position that I'm able to um, juggle and by necessity of having the university job and its commitments, the people that do hire me to play for things know that there are going to be times that I am unable to because of other commitments. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes allows a little bit of leeway for the possibility of me deciding I'm just not going to play that concert because I just don't really want to play that repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not really something that my colleagues in the orchestral realm can necessarily do. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, I really wanted to do both and determined that the route of, of doing the doctorate and going on and um, thankfully successfully getting a, a college teaching job means that I'm able to combine both uh, the teaching and the performing. And in addition to teaching and performing, you're also an active composer. What led you to start writing for the bassoon? Well, so my undergraduate degree, I was actually a double major in composition and bassoon. And I have had a, an interest in um, sort of the topic of bassoonist composers for a long time because I was doing research on repertoire and just seemed to come across a number of composers historically, but also through to the current day who are bassoonists. And I, ha I have some, I have my own story, I guess, about that, but I also have some theories as to why there may be um, what seems like potentially a disproportionate number of bassoonist composers. Um, so regard, regarding my theories, um, I think that there are a couple of main things in my, from my viewpoint, and whether I'm correct on this, I don't know. One is I think that the type of person that is drawn to playing the bassoon, you know, from, like from what we were talking about earlier in the dis discussion, why, why would somebody choose this instrument? I think it's going to be a magnet for people the, both of the double reads are going to be magnets for people who are creative. Mm -hmm. um, and not, and of course, anybody who's a musician is creative to some extent, but I think to choose this quirky, awkward um, sort of dinosaur of an instrument specifically, maybe there's a little bit of a, a, um, a different aesthetic to our, our outlet for being artistic. And maybe it's the type of person that is drawn to this may also have a, have a little bit of a leaning towards a propensity for other outlets such as composing. That's one thing I think. I think another thing is that we are pretty darn aware of our relative lack of repertoire compared to that for just about any other instrument out there. I mean, of course, tuba and percussion and, and even saxophone have had to catch up some because they came along later or at least blossomed in terms of popularity potentially later. But um, I think the bassoon really, we, we notice that there's, there's less stuff written for us and certainly less stuff by anybody famous writ written for us. You know, after you have named off the Mozart concerto and the Weber concerto and, and Hungarian Rondo and maybe the Sanson and the Hindemith, the names that we start, or Vivaldi, the names that we start throwing out are, are not those that a lot of people, even in the classical world, have heard of very much. So I think maybe there's some feeling that bassoonists need to take things into our own hands and create our own repertoire if nobody else is going to sort of thing. I don't know. That, that, those are a couple of my theories. As far as for myself, why I um, compose, 
many of my compositions are for the bassoon. Many of the ones that I that are out there and are published are for the bassoon. But I I did actually start out do straight up composing for multiple instruments. Um, it's often nice to be able to use yourself for workshopping a piece. So writing for oneself can be good in that way. And my my undergraduate um, was at the Victoria University of Wellington, um, which at that time, um, well, is is one of the the main music schools. At that time, there were f- basically four music schools in New Zealand, and that was the one in the capital city and where the um, adjunct faculty were um, players from the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, and they had a f- fantastic composition area and we would have um, it was a small performance school as pretty much all of them in New Zealand were then so every Friday afternoon we'd have like a must have been about a two or three hour performance class where all of the performance faculty and all of the performance students which was all of 20 some of us I think um, would gather and basically play for one another. And it was, was then followed by a seminar where the, some of the performers would stick around and the composers um, and also people doing orchestration projects would basically workshop the, the pieces that they had written that week or arranged or what have you. So it was a fantastic background in the, in the performance class, you know, having the vocal and performance and piano faculty uh, give feedback in addition to the woodwind people and, and hearing what they all said to all of the other students and stuff was a, was a fantastic um, learning opportunity. But then to have the opportunity of you, you've written a piece as, as part of a composition uh, assignment and somebody later that week, plays it back for you and then you go, Oh, that part's not so good. Oh, it'd be better if this was up the octave or this was, you know, on that instrument and, and just, you know, workshopping things like that was incredible. But as a result, some of my performing friends got to, we all got to know the composers. And so I would have friends of mine ask me to write pieces for them. Um, and one of the things I, I always enjoyed doing is that um, sometimes unbeknownst to them, because sometimes they didn't even realize it was what they did. I would, I would listen to them in the practice room. And I don't know how, if you guys have noticed that just about everybody seems to have like their noodle. There's some little <laughs> thing that they, they do and you go, oh, yeah. that, must be, that must be Joe in this practice room because mm-hmm. they're, they're playing that. Noodle. I would put that in their piece. Like I'd make it a little <laughs> theme in their piece. And, and seriously, it, it was pretty funny because some people would play it and they're like, what, what's that? And other people in the room are, are giggling because they know exactly what it is. Because it's what that person plays, you know, every day when they're like tootling around on, their, on whatever instrument it was. So... Um, you know, so I, I, I did the composition thing, um, as a double major in my undergrad, I actually made it still a cognate, uh, or minor during both of the graduate degrees as well, the, both in the masters and at the, the doctoral level. So I sort of kept it up a little bit. Um, I'm not super great these days at carving out time to compose, but, um, it is something I enjoy doing and, Every now and then I'll be in the shower or something and I'm, I'm humming something. I'm like, what, what is that? And then I realize it's something I need to write down that it's actually like a melody or something that I need to work with. So it, I do find occasionally, you know, how people will, will talk about poets and authors and composers and stuff will almost act like they're a, a vessel of mm-hmm. from another dimension or realm. I, I've I've had a little bit of a sense of that where it's almost like I've been haunted by a melody and I'm in the shower and I, I can't get, you know, I get one of those earworms that's in my head. Mm-hmm. I can't get it out until I write it down and then it's gone. 
and it's really interesting. And unfortunately, it hasn't happened in a little while because maybe because I've been too busy or something, or maybe I'm just not listening. But but um, that used to happen occasionally where I'm just you know walking along humming something and realizing that I don't think this is somebody else's tune. I think this is one I need to write down. I love that so much, and it sort of takes the pressure off too when you think, oh, I'm not in charge. It's just a little gift that I got. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have no idea where this came from, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you share with us a favorite memory of being on the stage? That's a tough one. I, I, I've had a lot of, of um, really great um, experiences uh, as a musician. I guess one that was, was really powerful occurred back when I was still in New Zealand. I, I was very privileged to be able to play a lot with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra um, while I was doing my undergraduate degree. They, they had three full-time players, but they did a lot of repertoire that required four bassoons. And every year they did a, a, a tour, a split tour, where half the orchestra went in one direction and the other half went in, in the other. And so they usually need two or more bassoons in, on both of those. And I, I got many opportunities to play. And there was one, at that point, they didn't have a music director. They had a a principal guest conductor and a series of guest conductors. And we had a member of the string section. I think it was a viola player who um, got cancer and, and passed away, you know, way too young. And we had this guest conductor who was Hungarian, um, who had been a childhood friend of Bartok's son, I guess it was. And we were doing concerto for orchestra and we dedicated it to the memory of, of that um, player in the orchestra that we all knew. And this, first of all, the conductor was, was incredible. I can't remember his last name. He was a Georgi was his first name, but um, just really, really first rate, musician had this person he had this personal connection with Bartok but you know so much of the writing especially in the slower movements of that piece are so sort of gut-wrenching anyway but when everybody in the orchestra was coming together to play it as a as a commemoration and memorial to this person I still sort of get just talking about it now, I can still sort of feel the hairs on the back of my neck rise up. It was just, mm-hmm. it was absolutely transformative um, experience. So I'd have to say that that was probably um, certainly one of, if not the, the most incredible experience playing on the stage. Do you have an embarrassing moment that you would share with us? <laughs> oh my gosh, so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is something too that I, I think, it's good to share with one's students that there have been many, many failures along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I teach a pedagogy class um, every two years in the fall, and we're doing it this semester uh, for doctoral students. Again, irony from the person that didn't know what that was uh, early on, but um one of the things we we talk about is trying to teach people about the benefits of failure. And I'm not sure how many um, specifics I can think of, because like I said, there, there are, there are many, many of them, but I remember on a, a, during my undergrad, uh, a sort of an honors recital that I was playing the Wilson Osborne Rhapsody and um, I think maybe because of the background of growing up playing in orchestra, um, and even when I did solo things, it was almost always with accompaniment of some kind, um, you know, playing with piano or playing chamber music with one or more other people. I think I'm pretty sure that was the first unaccompanied piece that I'd ever played. And I absolutely became petrified in the middle about the, the fact that I was the only person playing. Mm. And in some of those darn octatonic runs in that piece, 
just my fingers got all twisted on each other. And I felt like it was one of those places where I just absolutely fell off the bassoon in the middle of the recital mm. and somehow sort of got it back together again and somehow continued on and, 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 and finished the piece and played. And, you know, people in the audience were appreciative and friends and colleagues were complimentary. And of course, all I can think of is, is there a deep, dark hole I can climb into? <laughs> um, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I, again, as the, as the teacher, the, the getting that flipped perspective and seeing people, the look on their face when they've, they've made what they think is just the most horrific performing mistake of their entire lives and realizing from the teacher and listener perspective that who cares mm -hmm. if, if we're able to get it back together again. And, and if what you were trying to go for was maybe convincing um, or, or you dust yourself off and you, you get back on that figurative horse and do it again, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, and there, there've just been so many glaring mistakes that I've made through the years that it's difficult to pin it down to just one. But I guess that was, that was one that I, I, I do still recall. And I like to bring up that story actually when I've got students working on the Osborne and stuff for here, let's, let's work a little more on these runs just to make sure you're comfortable. On them. <laughs> yeah. I, and in the moment you feel like you want to die, but you're the, the person who is the most emotionally invested in it. The people who are in the audience are hardly invested at all. So it's not really a big deal to them when a mistake happens. Well, and, and also I, mean, I have, you know, I don't think there's a recording of that. And I have no idea if I was to listen to it now, whether I just sort of go, oh, that's really inconsequential. Or even if it wasn't, this is maybe a terrible way to put it, but, but I also think it's somewhat important for people to know that occasionally some of the, the, the errors that we make, people don't even notice them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they literally don't even notice them. I've had that with, with a student walking off a stage after a recital or something, and they're, they're going on and on about something. I'm like, you know, I know this piece really well. We've worked on it together. I don't even notice. What, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And, and we, we magnify it. I do find that thing where when somebody has a recital recording, and most of my students know that it's usually not the ideal thing to listen to it immediately after playing. And many of them will wait sometimes days, weeks, months before they'll listen to it. But um, when they do more often than not, the, the response is, Oh, that was much better than I remembered it being. And I think, you know, we, we can build such things up so much in our own heads um, that it's easy to get, overly worked up about things, mm -hmm. which is not to say that we shouldn't strive for high standards, but sometimes we put such pressure on ourselves that it just feels like, Oh, everything's just come tumbling down. And, and really it was not such a big deal. What is your advice for young musicians who would like to have a career like yours? I think it's becoming increasingly difficult now and, and and has been for a while um you know to to get any good career in the traditional sense of what we think of whether it's as an orchestral player whether it's as a um, collegiate professor etc there there are so many fantastic people out there players and teachers looking for and hoping for positions and there are relatively few positions to be had. And it's, it's, it's really tricky. I guess one of the things that I, I would like to, to, or do try to do with, with prospective students is make them aware of what a difficult road this can be, but that many of the traditional elements of you know, hard work and applying oneself, doing, putting the work in really can pay off. But I'm also finding, I think in academia, there's a lot of soul searching and, and thinking about, well, what is 
a 21st century career for a musician, um, as opposed to the model that we have grown up with, which for all intents and purposes is a 19th century model mm-hmm. of, of, you know, teaching and curriculum and things. And what we're finding is that people are, are needing to be a lot more entrepreneurial in their approach and to create new opportunities for themselves, Mm -hmm. not to sit back and expect that somebody else is going to do it for them and not to even necessarily think that, unfortunately, that they can rely on the old institutions being around in the same way that they Mm -hmm. have been for a long time. Because I think, the model of the professional symphony orchestra, the you know professional military band, um, which is probably you know two of the main outlets for um, a career playing for us. Both of those are on shakier ground financially um, and in terms of the future potential of of sticking around than they had been traditionally. And so people are having to explore different venues of where they play. Um, They're having to explore different types of collaborations, um, multimedia type things, um, mixed discipline type things. We're maybe working with somebody in a different art form or even some other discipline altogether somehow to get their point across So I think what's really important today is to not feel boxed in to the old models, but to actually look to create new opportunities and to be able to think outside of the box while knowing what the box is and to some extent what's in it, but being, you know, are we still going to learn our scales and arpeggios and our our etudes and excerpts and solo pieces Yes, but there are also other avenues that people need to to explore. And I really think that that for people to be truly successful going forward for it for the the current students and students yet to be to be truly successful, they're going to need to be very adaptable and likely they're going to need to actually be pretty creative in terms of making new opportunities for themselves Mm -hmm. and again being entrepreneurial and and being willing to try new things i think that ties in some with what i was just talking about before with the failure it's likely that not every idea is going to work out perfectly and that's going to be tough but i think people need to to find ways to self-market and to create opportunity. You almost have to, instead of sacrificing absolutely every other part of your life in order to have a career in music, you have to nurture all of the things that you are good at and see how you can mold that into something unique. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and some people are very good at, um, you know, organizational things and, and things of that sort. We, we actually, it's about three or four years old now have a program here at UNCG in arts administration and several of our performance students and even some others in some of the other degree fields have ended up, you know, maybe starting to dabble in that and then finding that they actually really are are interested in that side of, of the career. And that goes along a little bit too with, in some instances, some of the skills that they can learn there would be how to self-market one, you know, one's own ideas and um, promote things. But, you know, we need people that can organize things and that, and that can generate enthusiasm and generate money and, gen- and, and book venues and things of that sort. I find it fascinating, you know, in, in our, in the bassoon realm, um, I'm not sure if I don't, I think it's the same in the oboe realm, but I'm not sure. But talking with some of my colleagues in Europe where, you know, wh- while they're at conservatory, they determine that some people are going to be 
the ones with the great playing careers and some people are really great read makers and the players will buy their reads from the read makers and the read makers will not aim to, to play in necessarily the top orchestras, but will play in some other realm, but will focus on their, you know, read skills. We had a, um, a residency a few years ago by the wonderful uh, Reed Quintet Califax and uh, Alban Wesley is the bassoonist with the group. And while they were here for about a week, they played several concerts. They did clinics with our chamber music groups. They did um, master classes on each instrument. And I asked Alban if he would do a bassoon reed clinic. And he laughed and he said, I, I haven't made a reed in, in over 20 years because he had a friend that he was at the conservatory with and he buys all, his, all of his reads from him. And I, so I had him present about that to my students because it's such a different model than we're used to. But mm -hmm. I guess part of my point is sort of what you were saying that sometimes some people will find that their, some of their strengths may actually be appear to be peripheral to that goal of I'm going to be the best bassoonist or oboist that I can. And, and sometimes that's, super important and necessary and, and maybe even a better track for them to take. Michael Burns, thank you so, so much for joining us on Double Read Dish. This has been such a wonderful chat and we're just very thankful for you donating your time to our project. Well, thanks again so much for asking me and inviting me. I had a great time talking with you. I probably talked too much in the process. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> We hope you enjoyed that three-year extravaganza of Double Read Dish. And we hope that you will join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm acting like a weirdo. I know. Uh, you can listen to us on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, basically everywhere. If there's somewhere that you want to listen to us that we are not, let us know because I feel like we're everywhere at this point. So anywhere you want us to be, we should be or tell us that we should be there. I'm a weirdo. Gale next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna argue with you. Um, our next guest is Catherine Young Steele, principal oboe of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Jackie, let's end this nerd parade. Go make reads.